Welcome to Tuzam and Hi Tzipi. Hi Tzili, hi everybody who came, and we have a very we inspiring have... guest today. Right. Uh, Tuzam and is together, and we are here to meet people who really, you know, will leave us with some questions and maybe doubts. And today we have Tzili. We have Professor Vered Vinitsky Serusi. Oh. Uh, still the head of the Truman uh, Center in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and um, and a specialist in uh, collective memory. Hi, Vered. She's a professor at Hebrew University. She's a professor, yeah. Yes, I'm a professor of sociology at the sociology yeah. department uh, here at the Hebrew University, uh, as well as the academic director of the Truman, Harry S. Truman uh, Research Institute for the Advancement of Peace to get the whole, wow. the whole title. Vered, what's the difference between personal memory and collective memory? Personal memory, first of all, some would say that there is no way to have a personal memory without a social friends, that there is no way, except in our dreams, to be totally alone. Even the use of the language, which is a collective act, depends uh, on, on, on social frameworks. So actually, even our very individual memory depends on our uh, milieu, on the groups we belong to. At the same time, when we say collective memory, we sort of look at the macro level and the way in which we, as a group, as a family, as a tribe, as an ethnic uh, community, whatever, are affected by the past. So if we talk about, let's say, the time of the corona, uh, while we were closed at home, shut down, and I remember what took place in my home or in with my family compared to what we all remember as a group and which one affects on which one? It's, it's a very, very good question because sometimes individual memory Certainly, if they are generated by specific people with capital, and when I say capital, it can be cultural capital. It doesn't have to be monetary capital. So sometimes individual memories become shared, become to be a memory shared by a group. But more often than not, the kind of memory that is a, a shaped by the group, and we can maybe chit chat later on, what does it take to be remembered? Uh, not everything uh, is remembered. So some ways in which the group remembers sort of affect the way we remember a specific era. What I can say about COVID-19, that it's too early to even know if we will have a memory of COVID-19. First of all, we still live in it. You know, people still get sick. We are now talking okay. about the sixth wave. So we'll see sort of it's, it's present continuous. Uh, we can sort of reminisce or not so reminisce about the first lockdown and so on, but it's not clear that we will have a collective memory of COVID. But so what is the difference between collective memory and let's say shared reality? Shared reality uh, can be, can relate to many different aspects. It doesn't have to deal with the past in any way, shape or form. You know, you and I can understand each other when we speak about bread because your understanding of bread and my understanding of bread and our understanding of the reality of bread in our life can be shared, but it's not necessarily being affected by certain uh, uh, powers or dimensions that has to do with the past. So uh, how true it can be even in a few years if we look back to see all of us as post-traumatic of let's say even COVID specifically? Post-traumatic, um, I'm, I'm not underestimating a COVID-19 and its impact on many, many, many groups. Not everybody suffered COVID in the same way. You know, young people uh, uh, paid really, really heavy prices. I know that everybody, society tends to talk or, or many politicians and other leaders tend to talk about the prices of very old people and how scared they were. But when we look around, I think that, you know, a major huge of victims of COVID uh, had to do with parents uh, of young children 
They were stuck at home, more often than not in very small apartments, many of whom lost their jobs. They don't still have any financial uh, uh, security. They found themselves that they need to become their kids' teachers for weeks and weeks and weeks. So when I look at this group, uh, I'm sure that we will have a, a many dimensions of post-trauma that we will have to take a, a care of luckily, luckily, or maybe not so luckily, because uh, <laughs> uh, we grew up out of many wars that left their marks on us. Uh, uh, the knowledge, the scientific knowledge about post-memory is much more developed than it used to be, you know, following the Vietnam War or following the Lebanon War, which we now mark for the, it's 40 years. 50 years. Every war. But you know, uh, why I have a feeling that if I look at me and Silly, and mm. maybe you too, we have somehow more the same collective memories about Israel. It's almost like we internalized more or less the same myth and values and understanding of what, what does it mean to be Israeli. And I'm not sure if it's still valid. <laughs> well, uh, but we share more or less the same era, the same time. Yeah, therefore I'm us, saying so. it, yeah. Let me use a notion that was introduced to us by Karl Mannheim, and he spoke about the issue of generations. You know, if Marx spoke about the way in which class affect our consciousness, and Weber spoke about the way status affect our consciousness, uh, uh, um, Mannheim, Karl Mannheim introduced the notion of the positioning vis-a-vis -vis history as something that affects the way we perceive. The year in which we were born, in fact, there is this beautiful poem by Yudha Michai, uh, which is called 1924. And, and in that poem, it, it's a sort of a way to reiterate yeah. the idea of Karl Mannheim, of the importance of generation. And why generations are important? Because we, and I'm not getting into who is we at the moment, you know, but we, a specific group, experienced a specific moment in history that was extremely important, extremely dramatic, extremely traumatic, or extremely happy at the, at the more or less at the same age. And from studies that we conducted in, you know, I was part of a team that conducted that study in Israel, but uh, the scholar Howard Schumann did it in many, many uh, uh, countries around the world. He sort of wanted to take a, to operationalize Mannheim. So he asked people to mark the three most important events in their life. And when he explained to them, what does it mean by an important event? He said, not that your parents got married, but something important, something at the macro level, some sort of the memory you refer to when you ask me, or when you assume that the three of us share more or less the same collective memory because we grew up in Israel and grew up in the Israeli educational system more or less at, a, at the same time. And what Howard Schumann and his various teams found out, except in the Israeli case, this is like a, a, a trigger to what I'm gonna say in a minute, is that what really makes our perception of what is an important event has little to do with the nature of the event but a lot to do with the age in which we were when those events took place. And the important years are what we call in psychology, the formative years, 14 to 25. So if, for example, the man landed on the moon when I was 19, I'll never forget that. Right. Because it took place when I was in the right age to be bewildered and amazed and stunned by the events. All of that sort of collapse when we come to the Israeli Jewish uh, population. And here what we see is that uh, people mention events that are marked by, the, by their nation, regardless of the age that they were. Time and again, they will mention the Holocaust, World War II, uh, the independence, uh, the establishment of the state, rabbin assassination, and some wars. And when we 
try to interpret those uh, th that data, we see the power or the involvement uh, or the role placed by the state in establishing this kind of memory. So referring back to your question about the relationship between collective memory and individual memory, when I ask people individually to mention three important events in Israel, I'll end up more often than not among Israeli Jews with the oh, same oh. list of those oh, that are entered in legislation and holidays. So yeah. don't you think this is maybe part, I don't know even how to frame, phrase it, but for me, it was always the feeling when I grew up and not maybe until Rabin assassination, I must admit, until then there was some shared or collective memories that I understand what you say about age, but we more or less all of us view the same the Sixth Day War, view the same the Independent Day, no? But th then it changed. Now we have so many different collective memories, religious, right, and left. I mean, that was not so, uh, you know. We weren't as divided as now. I, to some degree, you are right. And to some degree, I think that we need to sort of thought. First of all, 20% of the Israeli population do not share those memories. Right. They have their Nakba and their Naksa and a totally different shared memories. Right. We are talking about 20%. Then we have another between 8 to 12% of ultra Orthodox. Right. For whom a Memorial Day for the Holocaust that is anchored within a month that's supposed to be a, a, a happy month, a month of holidays. Again, we don't share the same kind of collective memories. In addition, some other groups felt for years that their history never gained the importance it should be. Like the Sephardic Jews? Like the Sephardic Jews, religious Jews, those who did not see themselves as part of what I would say the Mayflower or the Israeli Zionist Mayflower. Now, Nowadays, with politics of identity and all the changes, all those cleavages, you know, are being sometimes they are being fueled by political parties. You know, it's a very, it's also politics also play a major part in that. But certainly, the, the state for many many years tried to sort of a, a compose one collective memory. I can say that there are. There is more than one collective memory. In but Vered, it's, I, you know, I, I don't feel that they were trying to create one collective memory. I think that they were just ignoring or pushing down all the groups that they didn't see the situation they will not in the same it. way. And I think they just, uh, they presented a, a situation that basically they wanted this to be the voice of Israel the and part. people and, and people thought that this is the way it is but now there's more room and more voice for all the others so it sounds so it, different. There is certainly more room uh, uh, for others and more groups also understand how important memory is for Israel because if memory and if, if collective memory wouldn't be important, we wouldn't be fighting over it so much. And I'll give you one example. The Ethiopian community, when they immigrated to Israel, many lost their life on the right. way. Right. Really, really tragic. The state offered that community to build a monument in Kibbutz Ramat Rachel, which is not far from Jerusalem. Beautiful monument, beautiful scenery, everything beautiful. But the Ethiopian community understood something very deep. They, they sort of um, they unpacked the Israeli code and they said, if we are not on Mount Herzl, which is the core of the Zionist narrative, this is where the most important ceremonies take place, Memorial Day, Independence Day, and so right. on. If we are not there, it is as if we don't exist. So they insisted on having a memorial there on the top of the mountain and they managed to get one. 
it's not located in the center of the mountain, but it's on, but the, it's mountain. on, the, mountain. on the mountain. But it's on the mountain. Very interesting. Can, yeah. can we measure the impact of a memory on the, collect, on the collective? I don't know what you mean by measure, but I don't know what you mean by measure, but when I ask my students, grown-up students, uh, uh, and I ask them every year in every one of my classes, how many of them stand still during the siren? There right. is the siren for, and I ask them if- Hold on, we just need to say that- the, the siren for the Holocaust. The for on the, Holocaust or, the day. Or for the Holocaust day, day or Memorial Day for the soldiers, we have a siren that everybody stands still for a minute. That's great. And it's a very, very impressive, impressive scene. Right. See, yeah. The cast yeah. of people stand still. Everything is, you know, we sort of break our routine. This is a silent that is aimed at remembering. And I ask my students, uh, uh, who stands at home when they are alone? Not as parents who need yes. to educate their children. Not when they offend the public outside. How many of them stand still when they are alone. And mm -hmm. I can tell you that for years and years and years, A, they are very angry at me for even raising the question. Wow. They, don't, they are very angry as if this is sacredness to a point. They never thought about it. They are angry at my question. That's and weird. more often than not, one or two, and I'm talking about my Jewish students, not my Palestinian students. Of course, my Palestinian students yeah. Won't stand, yeah. but won't leave their home because they won't uh, dare walk or run on the street when everybody stands still. They would respect the public sphere and they would stand still. But the overwhelming majority of my students stand still I'm not surprised. and alone at home. This is an impact right. of growing up, of disciplining our bodies from the age from age zero in our kindergarten. Right. That's powerful. Yes. So how come we were able to plant different collective values like Holocaust Memorial, Sarwen, et cetera, or not to touch flowers, certain flowers. I mean, always you'll have those people who will, but in general, but we almost don't succeed now in, um, not not to implant the looking, I mean, accepting the other, uh, reject violence, accept uh, different thoughts. We not even come close to to internalize those values as as a collective. I, I want to say a couple of things because I think that the campaign. Uh, that took place in the 60s and in the 70s to guard flowers, um, A, it didn't threat any parts of our identity. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was a sort of a parve sort of campaign. You know, it didn't ask me to give up any parts of my values or identities or who I think I am. That's one thing. But I think that no less important was the kind of campaign that took place. And I always look at this campaign and compare it to other campaigns that failed. For example, drinking and driving, for example, littering. All those campaigns were really, really threatening. Look at the, at the ads that accompany the campaign. They're always threatening us, telling us that we're really, really bad people. That wasn't the kind of a campaign that took place at the time with the flowers. I remember that because I was a kid in, 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 uh, in school and we had to collect specific and we learned about the flowers and the whole idea came from the educational system. It didn't come, I didn't stop uh, uh, collecting flowers because I was afraid of a fine. No one threatened with fines. There was an understanding that we all care about this issue. Now, coming back to your questions, how come? We have a hard time uh, educating a uh, Israeli population uh, to be more tolerant, uh, um, to be discussed by racism. A, it goes back to the educational system and how much the educational system and its captains actually want to promote those messages. 
You know, it's not enough to say that it's really, really not nice to hate the other. But the question is, what are we doing when people actually, you know, show all those uh, uh, behaviors? Do we wink? Do we laugh? Do we actually punish? Do we educate? Do we, do we make it the talk of the town? How do we cope with that? And, and, and within that, we can start to understand the failure of so many campaigns yes. in the last, I don't know, 15. And in addition, just one last comment, in addition, we became, I, I would say since the 90s, maybe even the 80s, we became a very, very conflictual society. Mm -hmm. Consensus or reaching an agreement is out of the question. Right. So where it starts? You see, but you look, you are in the, in the peace uh, institution for peace advancement, yeah? But look what happens. Peace is not the agenda. It's not on the table. It's not in the conversation. Forget it, right? No, we don't talk about peace. We can say the word peace, but it means nothing. And about what's happened between Arab and Jews in the country, it's getting worse. No, we, don't, we speak, no, when it has violence, or let's say something else, for most of the Jewish people, let all the Arabs, get out of our sight. Just beat it. I don't know what is totally amazing in that, in that, in the description that you're giving that at the same time, and I will quote now uh, uh, my very good friend and colleague, Professor Iran Halperin. Uh, um, I would um, say that what is so amazing about what you are describing. And, and I also follow the polls and see that the, the, the percentage of people that wouldn't like to have a neighbor who is not part of their little group, you know, it starts okay. with Arabs, it goes to, you know, it, <laughs> at the same time, we live in less segregated spheres. More and more of Jews share their workplace with Arabs. Right. More and more it's Jews share the university classes with Arabs. Wow. And we know from studies that were done by one of our graduate students, graduate student of the Truman Institute, that students who met Arab or Jews from both groups, students during their years in school, even after uh, the harsh events in the mixed cities a year ago, even after that, they managed to maintain the relationship because they had a previous engagement with the other right. group. You just point out that how do we, how can we reduce the, the poisonous relationships that really growing. But Vered, you know, um, going back to a little bit, you know, to the friendships with the Arabs, because you're dealing with this on everyday basis in your institute. You know, I do it in the center and we collaborated before, but there's something that always I'm asking myself after that, when each one goes back home, what stays, what memory they take with them? Uh, how do they carry it on? Because I always want to feel, and I mean, want to have, uh, uh, doesn't matter. I don't know, we have connect, bad connection, that's it. Um, there's something that if you, if we do whatever we do while they're at school or in the center or in high school, then they go back to their lives. I always feel that they carry on some memory or feel feeling from the same time that hopefully will help in the future to bring us to something. And I always wonder what would be the personal memory, the collective memory and how they will translate it to action and not join the other side or go backwards. Sometimes, first of all, I'm, I'm, I totally share with you the view that the situation is not, right. we're not doing well on that ground. No. We're really no. not doing well on it that is, ground. We're not doing terribly on that ground. Sometimes I hope that people will go home and erase some of their memories. Sometimes memories are a burden for a change for a different future. If we keep being a, a sort of slaves of our past, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not promoting amnesia or a Alzheimer or, or, or social amnesia of any sort, but sometimes memory and the past is a burden rather than an asset. 
But it's used by people who have an agenda. You know, no? Leave it behind. What? It's used by people who have an agenda. So even if we want to either erase it or not think, there are people who will come to remind us for their own some people are political and religious purpose. Sometimes we agree with a new memory that will serve them, right? So then it changes the whole attitude. Yeah. You know, you are touching on something very important regarding memory. That memory is a very fragile thing. Yes, yes. If someone thinks that they will, you know, mark will have a memorial day or they will have a monument or they will, you know, write a little new history book and then they can go to sleep and leave that memory to do the work, that's not the case. Memory is a wild, wild animal. You know, it can change, it can uh, be upside down, things can be forgotten for 4,000 years, and then they can be renewed if they fit a specific agenda. Masada is one of the classical uh, examples for something uh, like that for 2,000 years. Nobody cared about Masada. The whole story there was highly troubled. And then the Zionist movement needed something heroic, beautiful view. They changed a little bit the story. The manipulation the of the story. But you know, most of the stories with the long memory are manipulated by the needs, you know, of those who tell them. Well, I wonder how, if we take, for example, you know, one of the major events like assassination of Rabin, I really wonder, you know, what people are told about what happened and who are the characters who were involved. Because, you know, there is a memorial for Rabin and, you know, but how many people know the context? And how many I, people I, really remember Rabin? Oh, oh. Kids don't remember Rabin anymore. Kids do not remember. And of course, we never, you know, if I can pull my book about that, I actually have it behind my behind my back, but um, I, I wanna distinguish between a couple of things. First of all, many things that shape our collective memory took place before we were born. And we don't remember directly, except if we were alive during that time. So much of our collective memory, if I mark on the questionnaire I was talking about before that the Holocaust is very important. It's not because I have any personal memories from the Holocaust, but because I grew up in a certain age in Israel, and I was taught that this is a very important thing to remember. So we can teach, you know, groups to remember and to respect specific people or specific events. Within the issue of a uh, rabbin, we can see yet again the tribes in Israel. A uh, secular Jews, will know something about Rabin, either through their educational system or through the army. Ultra-Orthodox would not touch it, and I can testify that one of my religious students, uh, not ultra-Orthodox, is an Orthodox student. I don't know what kind of, how big the community from which he came and who he represent, but he told me that the first time he heard about Rabin was when he came to Hebrew University and became a student. Wow. That was the first time he heard about the assassination. Or about Rabin. Oh, wow. Okay, so the fact that we have a Memorial Day doesn't mean that all schools actually do something about it. Wow. You know, this is. No, I just, I just want to say one quick thing about the malleability or the transformability. You know that when Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, uh, was assassinated, he was a very, very controversial figure, no less than Rabin. You know, him and Rabin probably shared the same kind of a, a lack of people's a, a enthusiasm about them. Lincoln barely made the election a half a year before he was assassinated. 60 years later, on the eve of World War I, the American population is looking for someone, for someone to sort of bring their inspiration and they turn to Lincoln. Now Lincoln hasn't changed. His biography hasn't changed. American society has changed. And the civil war and the fraction disappeared and the generation that remembered the assassination and was there with all the hatred, with all the emotions disappeared. Something like that can also happen to Israel and Rabin or 
some other uh, characters. For example, when you look at Ben Gurion and Begin, they became more loved by wider circles. Right. That was not the case when they were prime minister or right after their death. Right, but you know, I know that uh, I fly somewhere else a little bit. What worries me now when I hear, especially in the last year or two years, the understanding, especially, I'm sorry, from the Likud and Bibi Netanyahu, I think really, I don't know, I will remember him by that. The ability to understand how you can inject to the brain concepts and knowledge, true, not true, but you can really manipulate us. And it became so sophisticated and so they insist on really pushing ideas all over the place all the time that at the end it's almost like our brain must almost adopt it. You know what I mean? Because when we were kids and you say, the Holocaust, we really, educational system did infuse us the understanding of the importance of the Holocaust. But it's not what we experience today by the, our politicians, the way they uh, push people against people by uh, sound bites, you know, that were used in a completely different way about the Holocaust or the flowers or, you know, I don't know if I really make myself clear, but it really worries me. I think that the whole system of communication and uh, the industry of information changed and developed in a, in a way that they can play with our memories and visualize memories, that it takes it, they can play with us much easier. I know. So and how do you think? It's dangerous. I know it's like jumping a little bit. So in the collective memory, because I mentioned Bibi Netanyahu, how he will be remembered that for me, it is exactly, you know, he was, he knows how to navigate the mind. He's a master. You know, like he's, you know, how the big ship. It's a very good question, how he will be remembered. And the first thing uh, that we need to, to look around them is the question of who are going to be his agents of memory. In order to be remembered, first and foremost, you need people and then you need institutions and you need time and space and the right culture to be remembered, you know, to actually be remembered. And then of course, if you have the right agents of memory that adopt a specific agenda, they can work on that. By the way, it's not guaranteed that they will succeed. For example, time will tell if Israeli society will remember Shimon Peres. It's not clear. It's always, you know, don't remember, most of them don't even think about him anymore. So, and, and think how central he was for decades. And he has a center and he's buried a, a, on Mount Herzl. But there is a lot of work that needs to be done if you want to make sure that something or somebody will be remembered. Built I think that means, what? Built an airport on mm -hmm. his name build an airport. By the way, if you've been a, a minister of education, the, the chances that you will be remembered are very high because schools are going to be named after you. Right. Unlike other ministers that may be really, really important, you know, ministers of defense usually are being commemorated in army camps, you know, each, uh, uh, but it's really interesting to follow the dimension that can make sure that something will be remembered. You know, time. but half of the country is named after Rabin. I mean- And Begin. No, not like the Rabin. Rabin, really? it was a huge spread of everything. And people remember places by the name of Rabin, especially the young generation. They don't know, they don't remember who Rabin was and why half of the country is named after him. So it's really, it's tricky. It's tricky. You need to give tricky, but it's tricky. I totally agree with you. It's very tricky because sometimes it becomes what I call banal commemoration. You go through that and you don't pay attention, like those small flags of a state that are there. You don't really pay attention. But think about two things. A, you wake up one morning and none of this exists. 
would that bother you or not? That's one thing. The other thing is that the fact that it's there is a sort of a time bomb that one day you will have to go and find out what the hell, who was the person whose street you're living in? So it gives you an opportunity to actually ask questions. It's there waiting to be operated. So if you would ask an agent of memory if they preferred banal commemoration or nothing, I remember I asked many years ago, Ethan uh, uh, Haber, who was Rabin's personal assistant, may he rest in peace. And I asked him about all those endless commemorations that you just mentioned. He said, I love them. Every single stone, I want him to be everywhere. That may help maintaining his memory. But you know, it's very interesting because I remember the first year that I opened the center, Leon was still alive. And uh, Leon Charney, your husband, yeah, my late husband, um, he was still alive. He, he was in a bad shape already, didn't talk even. But the student of the first year did meet him. So when we when we shared with them the film about Camp David and they saw him, I saw the reaction and I saw the way they spoke about it. The following year, he was gone. Everything was gone. So now I'm working very hard in order to keep the connection between why the center is exist, who is named People after. People don't know what is the center. So the Charlie Resolution Center. And, uh, and, and I want to show the film about Camp David and, I, and it's only six years. And I see how quickly it's disappearing because people don't have patience. They don't want to be informed too much because they have too much to deal with. And it's, you know, and it's interesting because these are kids from all over the world. So they have many stations in this, in the movie because Camp David was involved with so many people beyond the three major uh, head of countries. And uh, they feel a little bit something else because it's their country or they start to forget who the people from their countries were. And every year it gets, a very, it gets a very different thing about it. I mean, feel about it. And we still keep the concept and we still keep the idea because you, you need to talk about it and we need to do it because it's not solved. But I see how the memory um, is changing so quickly right. and the idea around it changes so quickly. And I'm not sure it's good because I think we need to help it connected all the time. Yeah. So, so how do we do it? First of all, I just wanted for a minute before I go to the main question uh, that I have. Uh, so in social psychology, I guess, you know, it's very important how I perceive myself according to how people perceive me, right? You understand what I'm saying? How do I know my, but, okay. But then how much, uh, you know, the reference group almost decide for me, how do I internalize values, me, whatever? You know, the looking glass self, we're going back to the looking glass self thing. And of course, uh, the way we perceive ourselves is highly and greatly uh, affected by, by our surrounding. But I just wanna go for a second back to what Silly said before. And the way you described uh, uh, how hard it is to maintain a memory, uh, uh, reiterate the idea that collective memory is a lot of work and it has to be done all the time because if you don't yeah. do it, it fades. Yeah, it fades. Yes, quickly. Now, uh, uh, my other question is that you are, we didn't mention that you are on the board of the film school, Sam Spiegel. Are In you? Jerusalem, yeah. In Jerusalem, right? So to what extent you think uh, films can change attitudes? Oh, wow. Uh, uh, that's a great question. Films at the moment are probably one, if not the most important agents uh, of memory, in a sense that once we're done with high school, most of us are not going to read history books for pleasure. You know, we don't do that. We don't continue educate ourselves regarding the past. And there comes uh, important directors, for example, most of the world, not Israelis, but most of the world know something about the Holocaust, not because they read a book, 
but because they saw the Schindler list. Right. So Spielberg becomes, and Benini becomes the most important agents of memory. So films and television series, you know, which became sort of a, mm -hmm. a, a, a very, very important popular culture a thing to do, affect and shape the way uh, we perceive the past, you know, the crown, if you follow uh, the British uh, series, The Crown, certainly change the image of what we feel, the knowledge of specific characters in that family. Right. And it would happen without that series and without its popularity. So I would look very closely at all those uh, uh, movies that pretend, wish, attend to, it doesn't matter, want to, tell us a very important narrative about someone's past. Sometimes it's our past. Yeah, but let me go back to what we already mentioned, that if you look at the Israeli films today, or I don't know about your school, or if you basically look at what films are, are promoted by the different funds, it's really, I have a feeling that less and less there are films about the conflict, and certainly not about the occupation. It's like really shrinking. Not only that it's shrinking, we just had an opening for uh, Tsipi's film, My, Dear, My Dearest Enemy, two days ago in the Tel Aviv Cinematheque. And it was on the 50, 55th year uh, of the Six Day War. And she wasn't allowed to mention the occupation, just the 55 year for the Six Day War. And this is something that can change the whole effect of collective memory because you cannot touch the example. bad things. And right. this is, I think, once you give up this part of the equation, you're going down. And I was asked not to mention the occupation, but of course I did. <laughs> it was in the center of... Uh, and that took place in Tel Aviv. Yeah, and, and this is yeah. the film, friendship between two women, Arab and, and, and the Jewish. Jewish woman age 14. So this is what it is, I, you know, and this is at the core of it was a question. Can let, me, let me use this opportunity because some of our students at the Truman Institute uh, organizing a, a series of films and meetings with the uh, producers or directors, and those films had to meet one criteria, dealing with the conflict, dealing with the occupation. So you're more than welcome. Next oh. year, I want to be the head of the Institute, but I'm sure the first will continue and we would be more than grateful to have you with us. Oh, this is great. Listen, um, on let's one hand, on a good thing. what? Let's yeah, it's keep, good. I'm let's saying something good, good something good. <laughs> so on one hand, you did open the, the road to understand collective memory, but in so many ways you also pointed what should be done in terms of education and uh, really trying to get people together, you know, and, and share collective memory as, as a nation, as society, you know. I, I would start by being able to share different memories that it would be okay to hear someone else's memory and they would hear my memory. Uh, I would like to respect other memories and I would like them to respect my memories. You know, the idea that only one narrative can win or only one memory needs to be the one and only is part of the problem because at the end of the day, both, both peoples are here to stay and we all deserve better life. Right, right. Let's end with this. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much. I actually, you yeah. sent me somewhere else, you know, to think about, so, you know, few things which really right. are occupying my mind. So, Vera, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank Tipi. you very much. Thank you, Tipi, thank and you. See you next week. Next week. Bye we'll bye. be here again. Thank bye. you so much. Bye.